His first book was uh, The Kaiser's Chemist, Science and Modernization in Imperial Germany, published by North Carolina University Press. Uh, the, he co-edited a book, uh, Frontline and Factory, Comparative Perspectives on the Chemical Industry at War, 1940-1924, published by Springer in 2006. And uh, he co-authored German Industry and Global Enterprise, BISF, The History of a Company. This was published by Cambridge University Press. Uh, both, it appeared both in English and in German. Yeah, pretty good. He also was the guest editor of AMBIX, uh, the scholarly journal published by the... It's the Society for History of Alchemy and Chemistry. Thank you. And uh, the special issue was dedicated to chemistry in the aftermath of the World Wars. Among his recent publications uh, are a chapter about women in the chemical industry in the first half of the 20th century, which was published in Women in Industrial Research, and an article about the case of the missing German quantum chemists, uh, which was published in Historical Studies in the Natural Sciences last year. His current research deals with life and death, literally, as he told me. Uh, he has a long-standing research project on the production of death, which investigates the production of chemicals and explosives in the First World War. And currently he works, during the sabbatical, he works on the creation of artificial life as seen from cultural as well as scientific and technological perspectives. Today's uh, presentation uh, is entitled From the Pistol of June to the Guns of August 1914, Beginning the Self-Destruction of Imperial Europe. Um, before we get started, I wanted to do a, give a, good, a quick shout out to the upcoming Kephart lecture on October 9th, 7 to 9 p.m. in the Villanova Room. Uh, uh, the speaker is Dr. Isabel Hull, and she will talk about reinterpre reinterpreting the First World War through the lens of international law. So uh, please give a hand to Dr. Kephart. Great. Thank you very much for coming. Um, and Yoda, thank you very much for your invitation to me to speak. Um, it's, uh, it's a little scary when I think about this being the centennial of the First World War that we're commemorating today because um, I was already a student when we were celebrating or commemorating the 50th anniversary of the war. So here it is 50 years later. I must be getting old. Anyway. Um, I will try to reflect a bit for you on the beginning of the First World War and, as I put it, the self-destruction of Imperial Europe. And I want to emphasize that self-destruction aspect because in, in large measure, the war was the beginning of what I would call the suicide of modern, then modern Europe. It's a little ironic because um, the um, Harper publishers years ago when they were a serious press published a series called The Rise of Modern Europe. And uh, some really great works were published there. But in a certain sense, um, this was going chronologically up until essentially the interwar period. And they had to stop there basically because it was no longer rising. Europe was <laughs> you know, going downhill. And one of the greatest books in that series was published in 1940, of course, after the Second World War had begun. And uh, that was Carlton J.H. Hayes' book, A Generation of Materialism, about the a generation from 1870 to 1914. And I cut my teeth historically on that uh, when I was an undergraduate. Um, but all he could really talk about was the way in which that generation anticipated some of the horrors of the interwar period, uh, fascism and uh, racism and all of these other um, uh, problems, including the beginning of totalitarianism. So I'd like to, uh, to talk a little bit about how that business came about and why this particular war was so self-destructive. So let's start by um, a quotation, which is um, in a biography of um, the British Foreign Secretary in 1914, Sir Edward Grey. And he's alleged to have said on August 3rd, 1914, to a friend, 
the lamps are going out all over Europe and we shall not see them lit again in our lifetime. He, you know, was in effect prophesying the horrors of the interwar period. There's a bit of a problem with this particular quotation because it didn't appear until 1925. Um, there's no documentation that says that he actually said it in 1914 except for the friend who uh, reminded him that he had said it. And that friend reminded him in 1925. So uh, all, all these kinds of quotes, just like there's a similar quote of Woodrow Wilson supposedly in April 1917 predicting all the horrors of the aftermath of the war. Um, there's a lot of what we might call um, invented memory here. But in a real sense, whether he said it or not, the truth of the quotation I think is there. Because in a certain sense the lamps did go out in August 1914. And the lamps that had burned at that time did not come back to light again. Not in their lifetime, not ever. Um, just to run down a few of the consequences, the consequences of the war, we have the fall of numerous imperial dynasties. In Germany, the Hohenzollerns. Um, in Russia, the Romanovs. In Austria, Hungary, the Habsburgs. And of course, the Ottoman Turks. Um, and uh, I'm trying to remember the name of that particular dynasty. But um, in any case, these guys had been around in uh, many cases um, since the 16th century or, or longer. And the First World War brought all of these dynasties to an end. Um, some of their pretenders, of course, are still hanging around in various places. But, um, uh, I mean, they've even made Nicholas II a saint, I guess, uh, in Russia. But why, I will never understand. However, that's another point. Uh, not only did it destroy these dynasties, it also bankrupted even the victors. Uh, the British, in 1914, were the world's greatest creditor nation. Um, the financial center of the world was London. And the British pound reigned supreme around the world. As everybody said in those days, the sun never set on the British Empire. Um, still less did the sun set in those days on the power of British finance. Um, arguably, the 19th century was really the British century, both imperially and economically. Uh, the British Empire conquered the world, and the British pound was the currency of the world. That, of course, ended in the First World War. The British Empire lingered on until after the Second World War, true. And some British banks still have pretensions to being import important financial centers. But by 1918, the Brits were already in debt to uh, particularly the United States, which of course came out of the war then as the world's greatest creditor nation. And I won't go into the gory details of why we are no longer that today. Okay, um, the French and the Italians, both of whom were on the winning side, found that the war almost destroyed them as nations. Uh, the French, um, of course, it, one author has written a, a book of the French victory and called it Pyrrhic victory. And those of you who remember your classical history will remember that uh, the man, Pyrrhus, who tried to conquer um, Italy back in the ancient uh, times, um, essentially he won all the battles but lost the war. And uh, after his last victory, he said, another such victory and I am undone. And so he basically had to leave at that point because he was running out of troops. In a certain sense, that happened to France as well. They achieved a brilliant victory in 1918, and they have never been a dominant military power since. The Italians, although they won the war, were so dissatisfied with the outcome that um, essentially the uh, the uh, right wing uh, paved the way for fascism, for Mussolini, and uh, for all the absurdities that were to come after that. Uh, we could also talk about the, uh, the way in which the war changed European psychology and social psychology in a certain sense. Uh, up until 1914, it was almost taken for granted that Europe would dominate the world, not just the British, but the French um, and the 
you know, the Belgians, uh, the Dutch, the Italians, the Germans, everybody had a piece of somewhere in the rest of the world. And that was the, the way that the world was supposed to work for the people up until 1914, with a few exceptions, of course, on the left who protested against imperialism. Nevertheless, it was assumed that Europe was the dominant power because they were you know, the leaders of the world. They were the technologically most advanced. Um, and by inference, if you're technologically advanced, then of course, obviously, you must be smarter than everybody else and wiser than everybody else. Uh, some people interpret this in, in racist terms, that Europe was a, a group of superior races. Well, the war put an end to all of those kinds of assumptions, even though um, some people, and I'm, I'm thinking of a certain um, Adolf, um, continued to believe in the superiority of, of what he called the uh, Aryan race. But um, despite all of that nonsense, ultimately, the First World War uh, broke the power of Europe in the sense that it deflated the big balloon. Um, up until that point, essentially, it had been um, the Europeans, the white people, dominating all the rest of the world, the colored peoples. But the colored peoples themselves had to be brought in to help the Europeans fight the war, and many of them returned to their homelands, realizing that the Europeans were no different than themselves, and indeed, perhaps in many ways, worse off. Um, we think of the, the famous quotation of Gandhi, um, the Indian uh, leader who was asked at one point what he thought of Western civilization. And his response, of course, was, I think it's a great idea, and someday maybe they'll have it, um, or words to that effect. So Western civilization, in the classical sense, before 1914, was seriously degraded by the war, and the Second World War just made things worse. At the same time, one has to look at the assumptions of the upper and, and upper middle classes and the aristocrats that um, went into the war in 1914. All of these people essentially thought it was self-evident that they should run their countries and that their countries should run the world. That again was deflated by the war. You know, those of you who have seen shows like Downton Abbey, you know, you, you, you know that before the war, the, the guys at the top simply gave the orders and the, the uh, underclasses all said, yes, sir, and, you know, hopped to it. But, of course, after the war, that was no longer going to be the case. Again, the people who were in the working classes had seen up close and personal how their aristocratic uh, officers had behaved, and in some cases, the, uh, the view was not very pretty. At the same time, so many of the young aristocratic and upper class uh, officers had been killed in the war that many working class people had been promoted and had become, in fact, the replacements for those people. So were those um, you know, young working class leaders going to go home and then resume their place of subservience? No, this was not going to be the case. And so in many ways, the social assumptions that uh, Europe had going into the war were overturned as a result of the conflict. And of course, one can also point to the enormous loss of leaders, of young leaders, older leaders, and potential leaders as a result of the huge destructiveness of the war. Um, I have a chart here that gives you an idea of the immense level of casualties now, these are only casualties. They're not just dead. These are dead and wounded. But many, many people came out of the war disfigured with losses of arms, of legs, of um, other parts of their anatomy, um, really horrible, horrible uh, um, maiming and disfiguring. Now, of this, what we can see is that um, on the, uh, roughly on the order of two-thirds, two-thirds of all the people who were mobilized to fight in the war suffered wounds or death. That's an enormous figure. I mean, we are dealing with, with young men, you know, ages 20 to 40, and in some cases even older than that, 
and two-thirds of these people were wiped out as a result of the war. A total, a grand total on both sides of something on the order of um, uh, 65 million people were mobilized and uh, according to, the, to this record, the total casualties were close to 60% um, in the uh, central powers, which is to say Germany and its allies, it was more than two-thirds. Um, the only reason that the figure is lower for the, um, the allies is that the United States which came in very late in the war, of course, suffered a much lower casualty uh, level than uh, most of the rest. So if you were to have left the Americans out and uh, perhaps the Japanese, who really hardly fought at all, um, and maybe the Greeks, who were, had very minor operations, if you leave those guys out, then the figure got, gets much closer to two-thirds again. So again, we have to look at this in this sense. If you are a young man going into the army in 1914, your chance of surviving the war is less than half. And indeed, you're down there probably for the people of, of the generation of 1914, um, it's closer to less than a third, maybe a tenth. Um, not that many people in that first uh, group going in survived. And yet, the irony of this is that so many people welcomed the war when it started. Um, everybody had a reason for wanting to see the war go. Uh, you can see a couple of scenes here uh, showing the, um, the crowds, um, you know, uh, seeing off the soldiers on both sides. The top picture is the uh, Prussian army going off, accompanied um, uh, to the train probably by their wives and sweethearts. And below you see the French cavalry going off from Paris, again being uh, greeted and waved goodbye to by uh, their uh, uh, female friends and lovers and family. Uh, of course, the irony of, of having cavalry is that um, uh, very, few, uh, uh, very few cavalry charges worked in World War I, and indeed very, there were very few cavalry charges held at all after 1914 due to the advent of trench warfare. And yet the cavalry, this is another aspect of the way the war changed everything around. The cavalry had gone into the war thinking of themselves as the elite military arm. They were the ones that were going to win all the battles. And indeed, some generals continued all the way through the war to assume that sooner or later, there was going to be the opportunity to send in the cavalry. You know, they, we'd break through the trenches and then, you know, a couple hundred thousand cavalry would go charging in and uh, uh, mop up the enemy. Well, of course, that never happened. But that had been the tradition going back um, for, uh, for, for centuries, really. All right, so military and political leaders all thought that they would aggrandize their countries or their uh, military uh, establishments, and indeed many of them did do so in, in the various courses of the war. But um, less likely is the intellectuals, um, who, many of whom had succumbed to the lure of what I would call social Darwinistic thinking. The uh, basic assumption of which is that conflict is necessary to advance the human race. And that unless there is conflict, and uh, you know, if possible, a conflict in which the weak are killed off, then you know, you're not going to have evolution because there's too much social welfare that preserves the weak at the cost of you know, uh, uh, human progress. Well, that was the way that many people thought before the war. Middle classes, many of them welcomed the war because of the, the thrill that they saw as um, you know, uh, the way in which war would bring glory to your country. Um, and, the middle classes generally tended to be very nationalistic uh, in 1914. Um, we think of, of the, of the uh, dec or the century from 1815 to 1914 as uh, primarily a century of peace in Europe. But we have to remember that this was also the century of imperialism. And there had been many, many wars, just mostly not fought on European soil. These were the little wars, the small wars that um, the uh, various countries led by the British, but also, of course, the French and the others, uh, had used to conquer most of the world. 
So each of these wars had, had been sh relatively short and victorious for the most part. So people were, you know, people were used to the idea of sending troops off um, to a short war in which there would be glorious victory and they would come back covered with honor. Well, well so that was what people expected in 1914. And likewise, the young people, well, they were eager to join up, most of them, because they exactly expected exactly that. You know, they were going to get glory. They were going to get medals. They were going to, you know, um, and of course, these were mostly young men who thought they were going to impress the women with their uniforms and, uh, and all the rest. Unfortunately, a perennial problem of young men, I must admit, having been one once myself. Uh, and then you had the radical socialists who thought, well, War might bring revolution. Now, the official policy of the Socialist International, the so-called Second International, was to oppose war. And indeed, that was what many of the socialist leaders tried to do when the crisis began in 1914. And yet, there were some radicals who welcomed war. Because particularly uh, uh, the group around Lenin, for instance, uh, and Trotsky in Russia, had seen that the 1904-1905 Russo-Japanese War had led to a revolution in Russia. True, it was unsuccessful, but the possibility was that maybe an even broader revolution would emerge out of a broader war. So some of these, in fact, didn't see the war as all that bad because they thought it might bring that great conflict that they were hoping for. And then there were many national minorities who thought that a conflict might help their particular minority gain its independence. And this is indeed where the Pistol of June comes from, from a group of Bosnian Serbs who were supported by the Serbian government, by Serbian intelligence, uh, secretly, um, through a, um, a, a paramilitary secret organization called the Black Hand, which armed them and uh, created a plan to assassinate the um, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne in the expectation that the collapse of the Austrian dynasty might lead to the breakup of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and make it possible for Serbia to gain um, more, um, more ground, indeed in Bosnia, which uh, of course became another problem back in 1990-91 uh, when we had the second war in Sarajevo. All right, um, let me talk a little bit about the intellectuals because um, you know, this is one of the things that I think needs to, needs to be remembered, that um, there were many intellectuals who were radicals, but they were radicals in a way that was not exactly anti-war. Um, if you get um, the futurist uh, writer Marinetti writing in his manifesto in 1909, these words, you know, except in struggle there is no more beauty. Um, and, and he goes on talking about how the only thing that, that's worth glorifying is war, the, only, the world's only hygiene. This is the social Darwinistic concept, you know. You, you clean out the weak uh, through war. And so they, they praise militarism, they praise patriotism. These are beautiful ideas worth dying for, they think. This is, of course, before they've actually gone out and been in the war. But, of course, along with that, scorn for women, because women, of course, are the weaker sex, as these pe people think. Now, one of the greatest of the futurist um, artists was Boccioni, and you see one of his masterpieces here called Unique Forms of Continuity in Space, done just before the war. But it's really the image of a warrior. And um, if you look at it, you can see this, this dynamism expressed in many ways, but there's a, a, something strange about this uh, piece of, of artwork. One is that um, it has no arms, and the other thing is that the head is much smaller than a normal head, um, which, you know, and it's sort of shaped like a helmet without a, a brain in it. And that, I think, kind of says it all about what these, you know, what these warriors were, uh, were expected to do. Um, uh, all body, little brain, and uh, not much thinking about what they were doing. Okay, um, and I mentioned the social Darwinists. Um, one of the exemplary members of that group was Carl Pearson, the editor of the journal Nature, which is one of the world's foremost scientific journals. 
who in 1900 wrote about the struggle of races, races and nations as the only means of human evolution, or, or words to that effect. Um, of course, Pearson was not really a biologist. He was more of a statistician, and thinking in terms of numbers. Um, not really the best way to think about human beings, I think. Um, take another artist here, um, the Russian, Vasily Kandinsky, who was um, in Munich, um, Germany, um, during the decade before the war. And um, he began to uh, uh, construct these abstract, what he called compositions, in a, a sort of a, a musical term, which began actually as images from biblical themes of the apocalypse or of uh, great disasters. He had a theme um, with an, an image like this about Noah's flood, and then he had other themes of the apocalypse. And um, of course, that's the last book of the Bible and the apocalyptic struggle of Armageddon, you know, the end of the world. These guys were really thinking about end of the world themes even before the war. One of his colleagues in Munich was Franz Marc, who painted a variety of horses, pictures of horses, but these were apocalyptic horses. You may remember the idea of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And of course, those are um, famine, disease, war, and death. And the years 1914 were to bring all of those in great quantities to Europe. Um, okay. Here is the map of the European war. Um, the Europe of the war, starting in 1914, and the, uh, the pink colors are the central powers, though um, what you see with uh, Bulgaria here and Turkey is these small um, uh, labels on there indicate that they did not join up in August 1914, they came in later. But the two main central powers were Germany and Austria-Hungary, uh, before the war, they had belonged to a group called the Triple Alliance. The third member of the Triple Alliance was Italy, which also did not join the war in August 1914, but remained neutral on the grounds that the Triple Alliance was only supposed to go into effect in a defensive war. And in their opinion, Austria-Hungary had started the war by a, um, declaring war on Serbia, which is here. So the Italians held off and then waited for the highest bidder, namely the Western Allies, to offer them gains at the expense of guess who? Austria-Hungary. So that is why they ended up joining in 1915 on the side of the Western Allies. Um, and of course, it wasn't just the West because Russia was part of the other side, which was the Triple Entente, Britain, Russia, and France. Um, now, the Netherlands remained neutral in the war, as did um, the Scandinavian countries and Switzerland, as well as Spain. Other countries joined in later. Um, Belgium was neutral in 1914, but uh, the Germans took care of that, uh, as I'll explain, by uh, starting the war marching into Belgium. All right, but let's not get to that quite yet. Uh, the Pistol of June was the political assassination of the heir to the Habsburg throne on June 28, 1914. That was uh, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife, unfortunately, who happened to be in the same car with him when the attack occurred. Uh, the background to this was the disintegration of Ottoman uh, Turkish power in Europe. Um, as you may recall, the Ottoman Empire had once controlled most of um, what we call the, the Balkan Peninsula, today, which is Southeast Europe. And uh, in beginning in 18, well, really in the 1820s, the Greeks had gained their independence. And then in the 1870s, there was a Russo-Turkish war. Um, but by then, even by already by then, the Ottomans were getting weaker and weaker. And um, between 1878 and 1913, they lost pretty much all of their foothold in Europe, which meant that a large number of um, countries began to emerge on the Balkan Peninsula. Um, all of these countries tended to struggle with each other for power. Um, meanwhile, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which had, um, had um, survived the revolution of 1848 and then reorganized in 1867 as a partnership between Austria here and Hungary over here, um, 
was not really just Austro-Hungarian, the Austro-Hungarian uh, countries. They had a large um, area of territory under their control, including what is today the Czech Republic, um, Slovakia, parts of Poland, uh, parts of today's Romania, and a large part of, um, well, uh, Bosnia, which is what we have here. Bosnia was what had been under Turkish control, and then when the Turkish um, uh, forces were expelled in the early 1900s, um, the Austro-Hungarian government decided to, uh, not to annex it initially, but to sort of hold it under a protectorship. Uh, they did finally annex Bosnia in 1908, and this touched off a crisis that almost led to war, but was narrowly averted through diplomatic negotiations. However, the Austro-Hungarians had come about out of that feeling more and more insecure. The Germans had felt that um, the Austrians had not been strong enough, and meanwhile, um, the uh, Russians began to, uh, to promote Slavic um, uh, expansion, and particularly the uh, expansion of Serbia, or at least um, told the Serbs that it was, you know, that the Russians would support them in case of a crisis. Um, now, Austria controlled in this area around Bosnia, controlled Croatia, what is today Croatia. Uh, the Croatians, the Bosnians, and the Serbs are all pretty much ethnically similar, but they have religious differences and they have cultural differences, even though their languages are almost identical. Uh, the problem was that um, um, with all of these different minorities under its control, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was very unstable. Um, the only thing really that held them all together was the Habsburg dynasty in the person of the Emperor Franz Joseph. Uh, Franz Joseph had been around since um, the 1840s, so he was not going to live much longer. And in 1914, he could barely hold himself up. Um, he, he would die in 1916, in fact. Um, but he was the one royal person, I think, in the whole Habsburg family that was widely respected throughout the empire. And so his personality, more than anything else, really was what was holding it together. And once he died, all bets were off. Now, his um, heir was the Archduke Francis Ferdinand, who was actually sympathetic to giving more autonomy to the Slavic peoples of, of um, Austria-Hungary, Austria which of course is what made him a target for the Serbs because again, if you could get rid of this guy, then you could of course weaken the dynasty um, because the guy that would replace him would not be anywhere near as widely respected. And this was then the plot hatched by the um, uh, head of Serbian intelligence with the organization that I mentioned earlier. And uh, ultimately, it, it came out to a, a series of accidents. Francis Ferdinand and his wife were to make, make a state visit to Sarajevo, the <coughs> capital of Bosnia, um, on June 28, 1914, which ironically or not happened to have been the day that many Serbs commemorated as the anniversary of their defeat at Kos Kosovo, the Battle of Kosovo, back in the 1300s which was the national humiliation of the Serbs against the Turks. And so for the Austrian heir to, to go to Bosnia, that was like a slap in the face uh, to Serb ambitions. Um, of course, one historian has put it this way, that only mattered to the Austrians if they had believed that there was any uh, need to respect Serb history. And of course, the fact was that the Serbs weren't considered a great power, and so they didn't deserve respect from uh, the likes of the Austrian Habsburgs. So anyway, they arrive in Sarajevo, and they're in a cab in a um, in a, um, a convocade in uh, or a motorcade, and one of the young Serbian uh, terrorists, Bosnian Serbian terrorists, uh, supported by the uh, Serb uh, Black Hand, throws a bomb. The bomb bounced off the back of the uh, the um, uh, Franz Ferdinand car and exploded in the car behind them, which had their you know, uh, uh, supporting uh, staff, bodyguards, stuff, stuff like that. So uh, Francis Ferdinand, of course, stopped the, the motorcade and immediately had them taken to the hospital. 
And then he went to the town hall and, uh, I mean, because this had happened on the way to the town hall, and, and he talks to the local governor and he says, is this the way you greet, you know, the heir to the throne by a, by a bomb? What's the matter with you people anyway? Well, of course, part of the problem was that um, they had diminished security um, for the parade because they didn't want it to make it, didn't want to make it seem as if the only thing that was keeping the, um, the locals from rebelling was the Austrian military. So, so they were trying to keep a minimal police presence, which of course turned out to be a horrible mistake in the long run. But then, you know, after that, the, um, uh, Francis Ferdinand decided they would change their plans, um, change the direction of the motorcade, and they would go visit the poor people who had been um, hit in, in, by going to the hospital to pay their respects. And uh, through a series of accidents, um, they, um, the, the driver made a wrong turn and then they had to stop the car and they were going to turn around and go another way because they, you know, the, they got a mix, mixed signals. And at that moment, the dejected terrorists who had been sitting in a cafe mourning the fact that their bomb had not hit Francis Ferdinand suddenly realized that there was his car stopped right in front of their cafe. So one guy grabs his pistol, jumps out, runs over to the car and shoots Francis Ferdinand and his wife. This man was named Gavrilo Princip and after the, um, he was actually captured alive and afterwards he said, well I didn't really want to kill the wife, I was hoping to kill the governor instead. But he didn't regret having shot Francis Ferdinand. Anyway, both of them died and that of course meant that the Austro-Hungarian government felt they had to do something. And the, the something they had to do was against Serbia because they immediately blamed the Serbs, and rightly, for this uh, assassination. This then led to the July crisis. Now, a month passed before anything really began to happen. It didn't really get started until late July. But in the meantime, there were a lot of political calculations going on between the, particularly between the German government and the Austro-Hungarian government in terms of what they should or should not do against the Serbs who were seen as their target. Uh, it has to be brought into, um, into uh, play here that the <coughs> German military had had long-standing plans to um, launch an attack that would basically uh, as they hoped, defeat the Triple Alliance, which of course, or the Triple Entente rather, which of course meant they would have to fight a war against both France and Russia, and maybe the British if the British came in, but they weren't sure about that. So the question was not how can we avoid war, but rather how can we turn this into a war that we can fight on the best of terms for ourselves. And I think that even though in, at many times the Germans claimed that they wanted to prevent a war, in fact, it was pretty clear from the outset that the, uh, certainly the military high command saw, saw this as a good opportunity to fight the war that they wanted on their terms. And there's a lot of complicated reasons for that that I won't go into right now, but we can maybe return to that if there are questions. In any case, the German um, High Command basically told the, the, um, the Chancellor, essentially the Prime Minister, Beethoven Holweg, that uh, he should tell the Austrians to take a very firm stand against the Serbs. And so they issued what's called a blank check in diplomatic history terms, which meant um, the Germans said, no matter what you guys do, we'll back you up. And that led to an ultimatum that the um, Austro-Hungarian government issued against the Serbs. And the purpose of this ultimatum was, you know, in, in, in counter terms to the Godfather, which was, you know, the, the offer you can't refuse, this was going to be the offer you can't accept. No matter what, you know, they wanted to fight a war. And so they had to make a, an ultimatum in terms that were so strong that the, the Serbs could not accept them without total humiliation and loss of sovereignty. In, in other words, you know, one of the key terms was the Serbs would have to allow the Austrians to come onto their territory and investigate the, um, the plot to the, for the assassination. 
and then they would have to allow the, um, the people to be judged under Austrian law. So um, the Serbs couldn't accept that one. And th that meant that, you know, Austria would then on July 28th declare war against Serbia with the support of the Germans. Now, that might not have led to a world war. The question was, what would the Russians do? What would the Germans do? What would the French do? Up until that point, it was just Austro-Hungarian Empire versus Serbia. The Russians, however, said, if you're going to attack the Serbs, we're going to back them up. And at that point, then, the Russians began to mobilize their army. Um, now, <laughs> from the perspective of the Germans, if the Russians mobilized, they would have to mobilize. Um, at this moment, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II, in, known to his uh, family as Willie, um, began writing a telegram to his uh, cousin, Nicky, uh, Nicholas II, the Tsar of Russia. And they began to exchange telegrams on this question of should or should not um, each side mobilize. And, um, you know, Nicky and Willie were, you know, as I said, they were cousins, not exactly friends, but they were both, uh, you know, grandparents or grandsons uh, uh, of uh, Queen Victoria of England, uh, since their mothers had both both been, uh, been their, uh, Vicky's uh, daughters. And in any case, the exchange went back and forth more or less to the effect of Willie saying, well, I'd like to be, um, you know, I'd like to intervene to uh, solve this peacefully, but um, you guys keep mobilizing and we, on our side, you know, Germany can't allow Russia to mobilize because that would mean we were in endangered, so we'll have to mobilize. And then Nikki replies back and he says, well, we can't stop mobilizing because you know, we have to support our friends, the Serbs. And uh, well, we'll try to do partial mobilization. Trouble was that the Russian military didn't have any plan for partial mobilization. It was either all of it or none of it. So um, from the <coughs> parlance of the day, the phrase was, mobilization means war. So as soon as the Russians mobilized, the Germans had to assume that was going to lead to an attack on them. And in fact, that's what they wanted anyway, because that meant that then they could mobilize and that would take <laughs> into um, account the possibility that the French would come in. So then they would start to mobilize against France as well. And that would then force the French to mobilize. And of course, so it went like a, like a series of dominoes falling down. Um, pretty soon everybody was mobilized. This all happened between July 28th and August 4th of 1914. Now, the key question was what would the British do? The British in the early stages of this, of this crisis in July weren't paying any attention because they were worried about a crisis of their own in, in Ireland. I won't go into the background of that, but uh, when they finally started paying attention, the Foreign Secretary, the aforementioned uh, Edward Gray, tried to set up an international conference to have arbitration and you know, try to settle the problem peacefully. But um, evidently, nobody on the continent except maybe the French took that seriously. And so Gray essentially acted too late. And he also failed to make it absolutely clear to the Germans that Britain would indeed go to war in support of the French and the Russians. The Germans, right up to the last minute, hoped the British would stay out. Um, but I think also some of them really hoped that British would come in because they thought they could beat the British pretty easily. In any case, not enough people made any effort to really stop the war from coming. And thus, by more or less mutual consent, all the great powers went to war. This then led to the guns of August. And the Germans had really initiated all of this as a result of the so-called Schlieffen Plan, named after um, the former um, general in, in the um, leadership of the German military high, or the Prussian military high command, who had retired back in 1906. But he had left as his legacy a, a plan. And the exact nature of this is still controversial among his, some historians. But ultimately, what it really meant and what was accepted by his successor, uh, General Moltke, who was the nephew of a famous Moltke who had been the leader of the German military in, back in uh, 1871 in the time of German unification. Um, what the younger Moltke has accepted was 
you would attack <laughs> France first, and you would have to attack France by going through Belgium, which was neutral. And when you went through Belgium, that would make it easier to get around the French fortifications on the frontier. And by a lightning strike, we, we, we would say blitzkrieg, but, the, but this was not motorized. These people were all on foot or on horseback. Um, by a lightning strike, you would wipe out the Belgians and the French, defeat them within a month or so, and then concentrate all your forces in the east against the Russians. That was the theory. The campaign of August was supposed to lead to the downfall of France and the possibility of then concentrating against the Russians. Well, okay. Um, they actually had a secret weapon to ensure that they would break down the, the Belgian fortifications, and this was a very high-powered <coughs> siege gun. Um, 420 millimeter cannon, okay? 420 millimeters, 42 centimeters, so we're talking something like an 18-inch wide, an 18-inch diameter cannon with very high explosives that would break, and did in fact break up the Belgian forts in uh, the first days of August 1914. Um, trouble was, in order to make this plan work, they had to attack Belgium immediately to uh, conquer the frontier city of Liège. And the sooner they got that, the sooner they could carry out their plan of going uh, uh, west uh, through Belgium and in, into northern France. All of that, however, um, meant that they would violate Belgian neutrality, which um, the predecessor, uh, Prussia, had uh, uh, signed and guaranteed back in the 1830s, international treaty guaranteeing the neutrality of Belgium. The British respected that, but unfortunately, the Chancellor Bateman Holweg of, of uh, Germany, um, in a speech, openly said in uh, the beginning of August 1914, when he announced they were going into Belgium, he said, well, we openly admit that this is in contravention of international law. But, he went on to say, necessity knows no law. And, man, I mean, this was supposedly a, a country that respected international law. The Germans had, had benefited from this over the years, but now they were essentially defying international law, and it wouldn't be the first time, unfortunately, uh, nor the last time. But, the British then said, well, if you're going to invade Belgium, we're going to respect the treaty and we're going to come to Belgium's aid, Belgium's aid, and likewise, we'll have to support France. And uh, the, the <laughs> German response was, how could you possibly do this for just a scrap of paper? This was what Bateman Holweg, the chancellor, said. This treaty is just a scrap of paper. Again, indicating to the uh, rest of the world that you couldn't really trust the Germans to respect their treaties. And I feel that this, this was unfortunately um, a consequence of this incredible arrogance that somehow uh, came across the leaders of Germany in 1914. This assumption that, you know, regardless of what anybody thought they were going to do it the way that they were going to do it. And, um, and they did. Um, and that arrogance, of course, led to disaster. Because the um, classic Schlieffen plan was supposed to have the German army, the, the mainly Prussian but also Bavarian and, and uh, Saxon and Württemberger, you know, it was a, it was a multi um, state army. Um, <coughs> It was supposed to, in the classic plan, go west of Paris and circle the um, French armies from the rear. The trouble was, they never had enough troops to do this. And this is where much of the controversy over the Schlieffen plan has come, because one historian in particular has argued that, well, the reason they never had enough troops was that um, the, the so-called Schlieffen plan was just a demand for more troops, but that the, uh, the uh, German Reichstag, the parliament had never uh, authorized enough troops for them, and therefore there couldn't have been a Schlieffen plan because they could never have carried it out, they, and they knew that, which may be true, but then I keep asking, well, in that case, then why did Malta go ahead and invade Belgium and, and go through the way that the Schlieffen plan seems to dictate, when in fact he knew at the outset it probably wouldn't work? 
And so you have this situation, again, this, this you know, uh, willingly going into a disastrous situation that you pretty much can estimate the outcome of which is going to be a disaster, and yet you do it anyway. Again, self-destruction. This is an almost crazy, suicidal idea. But that's what they did. And by not going to the west of Paris, that meant that, um, in fact, they, they had to come east of Paris, and that meant that when they began to try to circle around the flanks of the, of the French army, they were finding themselves between France, or, or between Paris, rather, and um, the flank of the, the French army. Now, uh, that might not be a good idea, because that meant that if the French uh, set up an army in Paris, which they did, they would be open to attack out of Paris. And when, at the crucial moment, um, at the end of August, when they were starting to circle around, it, it turned out that the German First Army was indeed opening itself to attack from Paris and also by a, a little um, noted group of soldiers who had come over the channel from Britain, the British Expeditionary Force, with a couple hundred thousand men, but just enough to provide the spearhead to break between the first and, and, and second German armies. And the BEF, in fact, plus the, uh, the, the French Sixth Army coming out of Paris, was enough to force the Germans back. And because if they hadn't done that, their first army might have been surrounded itself. That then <coughs> put an end to the so-called Schlieffen Plan. Meanwhile, in the east, ironically, the Russians seemed to be driving all before them. They had success against the Austro-Hungarian army, which was probably the weakest army of all the great powers. And then they began to invade eastern Prussia. Well, a couple of German uh, um, uh, soldiers, uh, generals, were uh, called to, uh, to lead the, the Prussian army at a time when the previous leader had not seemed to be competent, so they brought in these two guys, um, names Hindenburg and Ludendorff, who turned out to become the great heroes of the, uh, the uh, German people during the war, because Hindenburg and Ludendorff were able to defeat the Russian army at the Battle of Tannenberg in eastern Prussia. And they did so without the two extra corps, that is, um, several divisions that had been sent by General Moltke to aid them from his troops in France. Another reason why the Germans didn't have enough troops in France was they were worried about the situation in East Prussia, which if they had believed Schlieffen, they should have just let the Russians invade East Prussia and try to finish the job in France. But Moltke lost his nerve. And indeed, he lost his nerve in a lot of ways. Um, <laughs> Uh, suffice it to say that they won in the East when they weren't supposed to, and they failed to win in the West when they were supposed to. Um, a couple of scenes here to show you some of the, um, the ways in which this war was a transition from, or this particular part of the campaign was a transition. You see at the top, in the top picture, French um, North African troops charging against German field guns. And you see, A, they have very colorful uniforms which of course made them extra good targets, and B, they don't have any kind of protection, uh, no steel helmets, anything like that. Here on the other side, you have the Prussian machine gun corps here, um, and the Prussians had pretty good machine guns, though um, this particular brand of machine gun was actually an American uh, manufacturer, the Maxim gun, which uh, all the, uh, sorry, all of these various uh, um, armies had been using. Um, the Prussians have the famous spiked helmet, which actually is not a steel helmet to protect against uh, artillery, shrapnel, or anything <coughs> like that. Um, these were actually leather helmets, which were uh, there to protect your troops' heads against uh, saber cuts from artillery, uh, or from cavalry, sorry, uh, saber cuts from cavalry, um, which they didn't have to worry about too much in World War I. Ultimately, though, uh, the, the the modern steel helmet wasn't introduced for a couple of years after this. 
So I leave you with this final scene. Um, this is the French army. These are the regular French troops. And you can see again, they're not wearing steel helmets yet. They're wearing just their regular caps. And they're lining up um, in a, um, a, this is actually a ditch next to a road to face the oncoming German or Prussian army. And this is the beginning of the turning point of the war, the Battle of the Marne, and which the French held fast against the Prusso-German attacks. And between September 5th and September 12th, in a series of battles, they were able to stop the German attack and force them to turn back. And the beginning of this German withdrawal was really the beginning of the new war that was to come. The war that would last for four years and would consist largely of trench warfare and would cost the lives of ultimately something on the order of 11 million young men. And that is the consequence that this process led to, the self-destruction of Imperial Europe. Thank you. Okay, are there any questions? Yes. I, I was just wondering, Dr. Johnson, if um, you were aware of the, um, the seven bags of soil that were brought into England and Belgium, especially the Memorial Garden. No, I, I was not aware of that. <clears throat> uh, in November um, of last year, mm -hmm. uh, in the summer of 2013, a thousand British and Belgian children built 70 bags of soil from Flanders. Really? They were, of course, ceremoniously brought to England, where they were brought on a frigate mm -hmm. in the Thames, the bridge, the Tower Bridge opened, and each bag was brought off of the frigate individually by a, a, an armed uh, military person. Interesting. Onto a, um, uh, a moving casket, I can't think of the word, um, for a military parade that was going to be brought to uh -huh. the house guard. One of those caissons, I guess. Caisson, yes. Yeah. Or to the house guard in London, and then on the uh, November 9th, it's going to be the, um, uh, so the, the commemoration of this memorial. Aha. Uh -huh. Very interesting. Yeah. No, I wasn't aware of that. Thanks for mentioning that. Uh, there are many ways, though, that um, people have been trying to think up, you know, innovative ways to commemorate this. I mean, nobody wants to celebrate this. Um, everyone wants to take this very seriously um, because, of course, it was such a dramatic turning point and so tragic and so disastrous. But the idea of bringing soil over um, had not, you know, I, I hadn't got to uh, my attention. Uh, there have been other, other ways of thinking about it, but one thinks in Flanders about the, the soil. There's a, a famous poem by one of the uh, young British war poets who died early who said, you know, some far off corner of a foreign land will remain forever England if he was buried in it. And so what we see here is they're taking a, a corner of the far off foreign land and bringing it over to England so that in a, in a certain sense, the soil now has, you know, the blood, you know, still has the blood of those young men in it. And so in a sense, it's bringing, the, bringing it back home. Um, I think that's a, that's a suitable gesture. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, what uh, basically happened to Serbia and, uh, and uh, Austria that started this whole thing? Uh, <laughs> history seems to kind of ignore them for a while afterwards. Well, um, that's an excellent point. The <coughs> Austrian army was relatively incompetent, let's put it this way. And they didn't do very well, actually. They, they marched across the river um, and, and occupied Belgrade, but they weren't able to get much farther than that. And um, their, their attention was, shall we say, distracted by the fact that the Russian armies were bearing down on them. And the Russian army was really superior to the Austrian army. So um, they had serious problems on their, um, shall we say, their northeast flank. And uh, so they had a kind of a holding action in Serbia for a while, while they mainly worried about what the Russians were doing. And the Russians, in fact, did conquer 
um, in the fall of 1914, they conquered one of the major Austrian fortresses on the frontier. So that the Austrians were really worried about Russia, you know, getting in and taking over a significant amount of Austrian space. But they were saved by the fact that then the Germans came to their aid by defeating the Russian armies further north. And the Russians then had to turn their attention more against the Germans. So the alliance paid off for the Austria-Hungary Austria uh, uh, people. But it was a long, difficult war for them. And um, the Austro-Hungarian Austro uh, military was never really successful in this conflict without the aid of the Germans. Um, they, um, you know, they, they just never really did that well, in part because a large contingent of their troops were these Czechs or Poles or people whose sympathies really lay on the other side and wouldn't have minded if their country, you know, their country had lost the war, which of course it ultimately did. And in the process, by the end of the war, the Czechs, some of them, were fighting on the other side against the Aust Austrian uh, you know, troops. So um, it was a difficult situation for Austria-Hungary. And if you look at their, um, their, uh, cor the course of their war, <coughs> there wasn't too much bright there to see. Um, it was a lot, of, a lot of problems, a lot of weaknesses. And ultimately, um, you know, the, the, uh, the empire collapsed. And, and yet afterwards, in Vienna, they said, you know, um, uh, the situ well, <laughs> let's put it this way. In Berlin, they said after the war, the situation is serious but not hopeless. In Vienna, they said, the situation is hopeless but not serious. <laughs> yes? So, uh, back in middle school and high school, when I learned about World War I, I was taught that uh, you know, the assassination caused basically, uh, you know, as you said, the domino theory of alliances and people being drawn in. But uh, it seemed like, as you said, that Germany had planned a war in the first place and just wanted to use this to start that war. So do you think at the end, after the war, when they basically stripped Germany of everything, um, my, my, my history professor said that was unjust and the, the German people saw that as unjust and eventually thought they would do Do you think that it was just for all the countries blaming, blaming Germany for the start of World War I? That's yeah, that's an excellent question. I would argue this way. Um, it was probably correct to, to give the Germans the main responsibility for the war. Um, it would not have been correct to, I think, do as the Versailles Treaty did and give them sole responsibility. Um, assigning, in the, the terms of the treaty, assigning the Germany the, the entire responsibility for the war and thus uh, also the responsibility for covering the cost of reparations um, was really, I think, um, historically incorrect. And in that sense, it was also unjust. But more important, it was not smart. All right? I mean, uh, <laughs> um, Napoleon once said um, it was about something somebody did. He said it was worse than a crime. It was a blunder. All right? And this was in that sense, it was a, a serious blunder because it opened the path to the right-wing apologists for Germany who, like Hitler and so many of, of his uh, allies, ultimately you know, uh, turned the tide and managed to bring Germany back uh, to power. And unfortunately, with the express interest and desire to change the Versailles Treaty, to, to put an end to the Versailles Treaty and once again make Germany the dominant force in Europe, but that then, of course, meant World War II, because they, they um, one of the things the Germans constantly said to, the, to each other, young German uh, people in, during the interwar period, one of the, the main things all young men in Germany argued about was whether they could have done it better in the Schlieffen Plan in August 1914, if they had done this or that or the other thing, then we would have won. So everybody kept saying, well, if we only did it right, we would have won. And so, the expectation really was all along that, that sooner or later they would get the chance to, to fight the war again. And this time, they would do it right. And Hitler, in fact, thought he had done it right in 1940. Because after all, you know, they, they, they beat the French, and then they were ready to go, go after the Russians. So 
So the Schlieffen plan, quote unquote, in its modifi modified form by Adolf Hitler worked. However, <laughs> go back to this question of was it just? Um, in many ways, you could argue that the Versailles Treaty could have taken the situation even farther than it did. Um, they actually provided for the possibility of war crimes trials in the Versailles Treaty. Uh, that's something that almost nobody remembers today. But in fact, a whole list of a couple hundred people from the Kaiser on down uh, to some of the scientists who developed poison gas for the Germans were on the list of war criminals that the Allies could, under the terms of the treaty, they could have rounded these people up and put them on trial and, and potentially executed them. Uh, they chose not to do that because I think cooler heads prevailed and they decided again, well, maybe it would have been just to do this, but it wouldn't have been smart. Um, so from that perspective, um, there was a limit to what the, the Allies, there was a limit to what the Allies were willing to do to, to injure the Germans. And ultimately, you could argue that um, when it came to the crunch, the Allies, in, under the terms of the Versailles Treaty, actually treated the Germans better than what happened in 1945, when the entire country was occupied. And Germany basically, you know, as a country, ceased to exist for several years. Uh, that never happened in 1918. I mean, they, the Germans were pretty much left to run their country themselves and of course they had to pay reparations but the, the French attitude to that was well look you know the war was fought on our soil you know it cost us billions we're not going to clean this up ourselves the Germans should pay it and from their perspective yeah the Germans you know it, it was just to make the Germans pay you know they invaded us we didn't invade them so you know I think I think you can make a case that is not totally unjust put it that way Yes. No, go ahead. Uh, yes. Um, were, was uh, the trench warfare on, uh, was trench warfare as extensive on the Eastern Front as well as on the Western Front? Because we always think of like mm -hmm. Balmy and the Somme and right. uh, Verdun. Yeah, and it, the classic trench warfare was the Western <laughs> Front, but there were trenches on the East. Um, the, tr the thing was that um, in the East, because the frontiers were so much longer, the, the distances were so much longer and, and the territory was so much greater, you could never have the kind of situation you had in the West where you had a, an essentially unbroken line of trenches from the English Channel to the Swiss border. Uh, it wouldn't have been possible to do that. So they had localized trenches because all the armies learned to dig, them, dig in and to protect themselves. So you had to do something. If, if an army was going to be there for more than a, a day or two, they would always dig trenches. But, um, you know, that was, that was normal. There had been trenches, you, know, you could talk about trench warfare in, you know, you know Richmond and Petersburg in 1864-65, okay. But it's not the same thing, obviously, as the trench warfare of the Somme or, you know, the uh, late 19, uh, you know, 1718 period. So it's, it's trench warfare, but of a limited form. Yes? I recently read that the wife of Franz Ferdinand was a Serb. Was a Serb. So, uh, and that papers had to be signed that she could not officially represent the empire, nor that her offspring would be uh, in the list of succession. So it sounds to me that the Habsburgs had already been signed before the war started. Yeah, well, that's an, that, that is an interesting point. Um, I, I must admit I have not looked deeply into that side of the story, but but clearly, um, she was not considered to be suitable marriage material for Franz Ferdinand. And he had married her out of love, as many of these guys had done. Um, um, one of the other um, representatives of the Habsburgs had done that earlier on, and um, they had had a torrid love affair, and then I think they committed suicide or something in the 1880s, something. Anyway, the, the Habsburgs were constantly doing this kind of thing. And, um, I mean, it, <laughs> poor Franz Joseph. I mean, he must have just, oh, uh, you know, he must have just kept on thinking, like, you know, in the words of Louis the Fifteenth, back in the uh, 1770s, "Après moi le déluge." You know, after me, you know, everything's going to fall apart. And of course, that was true. 
wouldn't it, I mean, today you would think uh, marrying somebody from an occupied people is kind of a way of tying them in or bringing them into the fold. Yeah. But apparently the Habsburg didn't see that as much. Now, the Habsburgs, the Habsburgs, it, it's very interesting about the Habsburgs. They had always, since the 1500s, followed, they had always followed a very clever marriage policy. Um, the saying was, um, you know, other countries fight wars, the Habsburgs marry, you know. They marry to, to, to gain power. And they had, had very strategically married into the crown families of places all around Austria so that they could then claim to be the kings of, Austria, kings of Hungary as well as Austria. And they could be, you know, they, they took over Poland for a while. They took over this, they took over that. They, you know, they, they aggrandized themselves through um, this dynastic expansion over the years and generally lost the wars, but they would win these diplomatic coups and these, and these marriages. And so um, I think from the traditional Habsburg perspective to have married in that, this fashion in a way that really could not possibly have aggrandized the country um, just made no sense. And so the old guys and the old aristocrats you know, they were backward looking types. Obviously, they had their traditions, they had their ways, their values. They couldn't imagine how you could possibly accept somebody like, you know, somebody from, from a, a lesser people like that. You know, Franz Ferdinand should have married somebody from one of the crowned, he crowned families of, uh, you know, one of the great powers. Everybody would have been happy. But this, this new modern concept, you know, marrying for love or marrying for, you know, um, Maybe to make a conquered people feel better because you are sympathetic to their side, that kind of thing. I mean, it, it makes sense in a 20th century perspective, but not in the sort of 18th, 17th century version that these guys were thinking. So, I, you know, I, I don't know. It would, be, it would be interesting to get to know Franz Ferdinand a little better, but... Uh, I'm, I'm more of a German historian than an Austrian, so I, I haven't taken that into account so much yet. Yes? Uh, Dr. Johnson, you were saying that uh, the German plan to attack France in 1914 was rational because there wasn't enough troops. Um, to, you know, you're a German historian. To what extent did the German high command sort of see French governance as being irrational, sort of being a legacy of turmoil since 1789? Do you think that they figured that? Um, I'm not sure I understand what you're, what you're arguing, because if you go back to 1870-71, the French Rebellion, I guess you're thinking of the Commune, um, really only came after the, the government was, you know, the military was defeated and the empire fell, and then you had the Commune take over in the sort of the vacuum of, of power that had emerged at that point. But that was a different situation. 1914, you have a republic, and yes, there is a, there is a radical socialist element, and they are a, a, a powerful group politically, but that group was tending to work more with the government and support the republic. So that um, the few people that really opposed the war outright um, were leaderless after the assassination of one of the major um, socialist opponents of the war, Jean Jaurès. Um, he was he was shot by a nationalist in uh, you know in in the I think it was uh, around July 30th or uh, August 1st, somewhere in there at the time when he was still hoping that he could avert the war. Um, they, they shot him, and and that then deprived that faction, the anti-war faction, of leadership. And by and large, I think. Um, when it was clear the Germans were attacking, the working class and, and the socialists joined in and supported the war. So, um, but to go back to what the, what the German military might have planned or not planned, that's, that, I've never seen any reference to the Germans assuming there might be a, a French um, revolution, if you will, if they were able to de defeat the, the French army. Um, if anything, they would have been worried about the reverse, which is to say, um, 
if the French army were defeated, there would be a mobilization of basically uh, militias who would then fight in a guerrilla war type of situation. That was actually what the Germans expected to happen. And they had taken uh, pains to teach their troops what to do in that case, namely shoot the civilians, okay? Um, and they were prepared to do that. They, they started doing that in Belgium and uh, you know, when they, they had been attacked or thought they had been attacked by civilians, they rounded up hostages and then if any further attacks occurred, they would execute these people, just put them up against the wall and shoot them. And they did that over and over again. And of course, there was a huge controversy over that as, as uh, German atrocities. They burned down libraries. You know, they did all kinds of really horrible things. But this was under the expectation that civilians would act against them. And the only way to stop that from happening would be to take the you know, severest possible measures against civilian rebels. That was what the, the Germans expected. And, they were assuming that would happen in France as well because that was also what had happened in 1870. In fact, the whole concept that they used, um, the, uh, these uh, guerrilla warriors were called franc tireurs, uh, um, tireur, I guess is the French, free shooters. Okay? That was a term that came from the 1870-71 war. And so based on their lessons from that war, they were telling the troops, OK, this is what we'll, we're going to do in case we see these same people. And they saw them, you know, <laughs> kind of almost uh, by default, they, they found them in Belgium. I say by default because everybody had been led to believe these would, would happen. And so if there was a stray shot, then it would be assumed, oh, yeah, the civilians are attacking us. Therefore, we're going to round them up and shoot them. And all too much of that happened. Yes? Do you think the uh, German high command believed entirely that the sheep was planned to work? Or why didn't they just take the, 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 the bulk of their manpower and go right across, right, in, right into Paris oh, from, um, from Germany, much like they did in the Second World War? Well, they, they couldn't really do that because there were quite strong fortifications along, there were fortresses all along the border. And I mean, it was no. A Maginot line like there was in 1940, but but um, all the major frontier cities had fortresses around them. Verdun was only one, but there were others. And the Germans could not simply march across open country. They had to use roads and railroads, and all of those went through the major cities, which meant they would have to conquer these fortress cities in order to advance because otherwise they'd be attacked in the rear from the garrisons of those places. So um, the idea of just marching across the border into central France was something that they had already pretty much looked at and decided that it would be too costly to do. Um, they in fact did do some of that in Alsace um, on the border because Alsace-Lorraine um, had been occupied by the French back in the days of Louis the uh, 14th and then the uh, Germans had taken it back in 1871 and then um, uh, you know the, the French wanted to take Alsace back and so the expectation was that the French army would invade Alsace again moving across the border directly into German territory and that meant attacking the German fortifications which they did and um, it cost them the French um, enormous casualties because they, you know, there they had unprotected soldiers going against fortifications and being shot down by, um, by artillery and machine guns. So um, it really wasn't a very profitable enterprise to try to do that. And instead, this was why the concept of the Schlieffen Plan had been developed, that you would go through the weaker Belgian fortifications and then outflank the French border fortification line. Uh, because if you march through northern France out of Belgium, there wouldn't be fortresses along the line of a neutral country, which Belgium was. So that was the, that was the principle of it. And General Maltke essentially couldn't think of anything better to do than, than to do that. And he just hoped that he'd be able to somehow catch the French army out in the open and, and surround them. But I think after looking at the numbers, in August 1914, he realized he couldn't get around Paris.
because he just didn't, he couldn't stretch his troops that thin. You know, Schlieffen had apparently said uh, shortly before his death, you know, keep the right wing strong, which is to say the, the wing going around the, the flank. And he had said, some, at another point he had said, let the last man on the right brush the channel with his sleeve, okay? But in order to have a line that long, you needed X number of men, and they didn't have that many. And he even made it worse by sending those guys over to uh, East Prussia to, to fight the Russians when he could have kept them in France. Uh, historically, we now know he, uh, he made a mistake doing that. But, um, but that only further weakened an already too weak line to do what the classic Schlieffen plan had, had uh, been supposedly drawn up to do. So they would have needed, you know, they would have needed another army, basically, of, of a couple hundred thousand men to be able to do that. And they just didn't have those additional men. Um, that, you know, that was just the way it worked out. I, I think, fortunately for history, because I don't think it would have been a good idea for the uh, Prussian military to have won the war. Um, <laughs> um, and that's another issue that we can talk about, but that's, you know, it's a counterfactual proposition, right? Since nobody can know how it would have worked out if it had come out differently. Okay, other questions? Yes? Yes, it's on the same subject. I don't quite understand the logistics. Why was it, why did you need more men to attack Paris from the left flank than the east? Was it a matter of numbers or was it a matter of supply lines? Well, it was both, actually, because um, here's what the, the, the closest thing to the classic Schlieffen plan that we can find a document for called for them, as I said, to go to the west of Paris. And as they went around Paris to guard the supply lines, they needed eight what were called substitute army corps. They were substitute because or replacement corps because this was not part of the regular army. They would have been brought in, um, presumably drafted out of the militias or whatever, and put in to protect those flanks and guard the supply lines as they went around Paris. Um, the only trouble was they didn't have eight of these replacement corps. They had maybe two. And so they couldn't possibly have gone around and protected their flanks and thus their supply lines adequately to make this work. Pardon? Did they just move down to the east? Well, um, they did, in fact, as it worked out. I, I actually should have put the map in that, that shows this, and uh, I, I could look this up. But, but basically what we had was, um, if we can go here, wait a minute, I'll, I'll go back to my, the closest thing I have to the map here, which all right, so this is Belgium. This is the, the fortified French line here. This is Alsace. All right, so the, the French, or sorry, the German plan was to go this way. If in the classic Schlieffen plan, this is Paris, okay? So they would have gone around Paris, cutting off all of these rail lines, and then caught the French army somewhere here between Paris and the frontier, but, but basically south of Paris. And the hope was they would cut off Paris from uh, reinforcements so that, that um, there could not, the, the French would not have been able to gather a huge army in Paris to attack them. As it turned out, since they didn't have the troops to go around this way, they came in this way. And at this point here, you know, as they start to turn this way to attack, you know, and outflank the uh, French army there, they're opening their rear to attack out of Paris. And the French military had already set up an emergency sixth army based in Paris. And um, indeed, they were moving these people with, with taxi cabs. They had, um, they had recruited from the cab drivers in, uh, in Paris, okay? The, the famous taxis of the Marne, which they, uh, you know, they sent these guys in to, to plug the gaps. But um, also the British Expeditionary Force, which had landed in uh, Belgium, had, had had to retreat all the way down. And, and they were coming in in this area as well. So the, the German extreme, the army on the extreme German right, which is to say here, was the first army of General von Kluck. And he was the one that was supposed to guard the flanks of the other armies. But his own flank was now exposed. 
And as he turned this way, it would have meant um, he was open to attack from Paris. So he had to backtrack and form a line roughly here facing the French in Paris. But when he backtracked, that opened the gap between the first and the second German armies. So that then the British Expeditionary Force and the other French reinforcements could come in here between the first and the second. And that gap could have been disastrous if the first army had been totally cut off. Then that would have been, that would have been it for the Germans because that would have been the exact opposite of what the Schlieffen plan was supposed to do. It would have been the Germans being outflanked and wiped out. So at that point, um, this was really the beginning of the, of the reverse, as they say, at the Marne. And the Marne River runs right along here. So the, the, um, the Germans backtracked and the French held the Marne in various engagements and then began to push them back. And finally, the, the frontier line, the, the, the trench line went basically from here to here, all along the, the, um, the frontier, um, but all in France. And, and, it, and the very, uh, here, the very extreme west corner of Belgium. But most of the fighting took place in France and a little bit in, in um, western Belgium. And that was the way it stabilized by the end of 1914, and that was pretty much the way it stayed for the next four years. Okay, any other questions? Yes? Can you characterize the German under, understanding of British mobilization as simply responding to the 18th British Treaty? Um, I'm curious, did the German general staff understand or have an understanding how significant an occupied Belgium was? to British policy as far as the government is concerned? Yeah, that's a good question. Many of the German military leaders left those kinds of political issues out of their calculations and just simply thought in military terms about you know, how many troops it would take and what strategy they would use to win the war and didn't really take into account the, the possibility that by invading Belgium that would then touch off a British counter move. Um, that, those kinds of questions they left to the foreign office, to the diplomats and, uh, and to the chancellor. And of course the chancellor, Beit van Holweg, could have vetoed this whole plan. The problem is that from the perspective of the Prussian high command, the only person that they were responsible to was the Kaiser. And the Chancellor could not speak directly to the conduct of the war. So the Kaiser ultimately was the guy who had to decide whether or not this would work. Trouble was, the Kaiser essentially respected Maltke as, you know, he, he, the name Maltke was a magic name in Prussia because of the, the uh, uncle Maltke, who had been the mastermind who helped Germany unify by winning the three wars of unification in the 1860s up to 1870-71. And so the Kaiser, I think, really had faith that the younger Maltke would be a similar mastermind and would lead Germany to victory. And so he essentially left the, the generalship to Maltke and accepted the possibility that you know, these things would happen and didn't, didn't veto it. You know, he, he simply took into account the possibility that yes, Belgium would be invaded and then the British might come in. Um, but again, it's, it's ironic because ever since 1908, when the Kaiser had, had given a notorious interview to the British Daily Telegraph and had, had made a couple of really stupid mistakes in the way he, he was talking about Germany and England and you know, he, he made all kinds of really he just mouthed off too many times and, and um, uh, totally embarrassed the uh, German government and, um, and so forth. And so what they had done after that was to freeze the Kaiser out of foreign policy decisions. They had done everything they could to prevent the Kaiser from understanding or knowing what was actually going on in German diplomacy. So in effect, what, what, what was happening was there was a compartmentalization of the German military policy and the German foreign policy when they should have been united. 
But there was no agency to bring these all together except the Kaiser. And the Kaiser was being actively, essentially actively prevented from understanding the details by the, the, the subsidiary leaders in both of these departments, both the military and, and the diplomatic. Nobody trusted the Kaiser because everybody thought the Kaiser was too weak. He didn't have the kind of determination that they thought a real Prussian should have. Um, he would, you know, he would say something and then somebody would come, somebody else would come and talk to him and would persuade him to do something else. And then he would, he would be all in favor of that and then somebody else would come to him. So the, you know, the military, whoever had his ear the last thought that he was going to follow his policy and ultimately people got so frustrated they tried to keep the Kaiser out of it. I didn't mention that in the, the making of the July crisis, essentially what was happening was with the Kaiser was they said, um, yes, yes, um, your highness, um, uh, we know that in July you always take uh, your, um, your ocean voyage to the, um, you know, to the Baltic Sea, so you should do that so that nobody will suspect that anything funny is going on. And so we'll send him off, you know, this is what the diplomats and the military people were thinking, we'll send the Kaiser off to the North Sea and he can stay there. Um, and he, in fact, did right until the, the day before the um, Austro-Hungarian ultimatum. And we'll keep him out of trouble that way, right? Everybody will think everything's normal. And then, uh, of course, when the Kaiser came back, he, to his shock and surprise, discovered that the Austrians had sent this ultimatum to the Serbs. The Serbs had accepted all but one provision. And then the Kaiser writes in a marginal note, well, now there's no more reason for the war. And of course, at that point, the masterminds on the, in the military, in the German, the Prussia-German military said, oh my, ah, the Kaiser's gonna stop us from fighting this war that we've all planned and it's all ready to go. So uh, Moltke went to him and he said, no, 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 can't do it that way. The Austrians have to fight the Serbs, and then everything else has to happen after that, which it did. And so the, the Kaiser turns out to have been something of a bit player in a lot of the, this, this stuff. At a time when he really should have been the man making the decisions, he was ultimately not. And because of that, uh, again, that's another reason why this whole self-destruction process occurred, because uh, the people who, in theory, were ultimately responsible were really frozen out of the real decision-making. And Nicholas II wasn't much better off because his, um, his diplomatic and military people essentially outmaneuvered him as well. And Nicholas was not even as smart as Wilhelm. Frankly, Nicholas's greatest ambition in the world was to uh, retire and, uh, and uh, go to a farm and chop wood, I think, or something like that anyway. Um, he, uh, I think he said at the end of the war when he had abdicated after the revolution, he was hoping that he could move to England and settle there, um, you know, and run a, a small farm and, you know, be a gentleman farmer or something like that. Um, <laughs> of course, he didn't get that chance, but had he been a little smarter in 1914, perhaps, you know, he could have lived to um, enjoy a ripe old age. But again, we'll never know. But it's the incompetence of the people at the top that in large part ends up producing the disaster that we see. Unfortunately, that is not just true of World War I. Any other comments, questions? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, where are the Americans? Oh, we, we don't fit in at all. Um, the <laughs> well, the United States did not join the war until um, April of 1917, after Woodrow Wilson was reelected on the campaign of keeping us out of the war. And uh, um, uh, that would take a whole other lecture to talk about. But, but the fact was that then, after mobilizing or beginning our mobilization in April of 1917, at that time we had an, an army of maybe 100,000 men, and we were no better off than the English had been in, in uh, August 1914. And so it took us essentially another year before we had enough troops to send over to make any difference. And where did they go to? They, they went to France. They, they went, yeah, 
the only theater, as far as I know, that, that American troops served in in any numbers was France, though we did send a small expeditionary force to Russia, um, complicated story, um, to try to stop the Bolsheviks from taking over, but that didn't work either. Um, however, um, we had several, by the end of the war, we had several million men in France, um, but most of the men that were mobilized didn't actually go to the front. Um, a relatively small American expeditionary force fought in the, in the front and helped to turn the tide against the Germans in 1918. But um, uh, we were bit players until the very end, and um, at least militarily. And that was, I think, one of the reasons why our casualty figures were so much lower than everybody else. Uh, Percentage-wise, our casualties were about the same, but it was just much, much smaller numbers of men who actually um, were under fire. Okay, I think um, we're probably we're probably far enough along here. So, a lot of people have left. So, um, thanks to all of you for attending. Um, it was a lot of fun for me to uh, talk about something I've been interested in for a long time. So, uh, all the best and. Uh, See you another time.